uh, this past year, we asked our friends in the Human Rights Initiative to look at how the U.S. government partners with business and civil society to address human rights concerns with local security forces. The report, Aligning Partnerships for Security, that we're launching today is the result of this work. Uh, as most are probably aware, there has long been a belief that this country's economic and security interests are in tension, are in tension with our values, uh, despite a significant body of evidence that suggests democratic societies are more peaceful and better partners. This report argues that it is in our interest to support democratic institutions that are able to uphold the rule of law, manage political and societal disputes, and protect civilians from harm. Not only is this the right thing to support, it is also vital to creating a stable climate for investment and private se sector-led development. A criti critical conduit for this is through the U.S. government's significant security assistance it provides each year to partner nations. Through its various buckets, the United States, according to the report, now provides security assistance to 137 nations. Uh, but there is a role for civil society, both local and international, that can help to train security forces, monitor security forces' adherence with agreed standards and report violations, and ensure that all voices are represented in negotiations. There is also a role for the private sector, especially the extractive sector, uh, which is often vital to local economies and has a unique role to play in ensuring that security forces respect human rights. The report notes, and I quote, in a number of countries, the U.S. government, American companies, and civil society share a common interest in seeing public and private security forces act in a way that is professional and abides by international rights standards, as well as national and subnational laws and regulations. Building on this common interest is crucial to ensuring that the number of countries' security forces that respect human rights and become reliable actors within democratic societies increases. To that end, the report makes a number of helpful recommendations to the U.S. government, civil society, and the private sector. I commend this report to everyone. It is an important starting point for what is a necessary conversation. I want to thank Shannon Green, Director of the Human Rights Initiative, and her team for this timely report and all their efforts over the course of the last several months. I also want to thank our partners at Chevron for their continued support of USLD and specifically their support of this project. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Shannon Green. Thank you, Connor. Um, to amplify what Connor said, we're very fortunate to have you all here today to roll out what I think is a really important report, and which is really the culmination of about a year's worth of work on this topic. Um, for the past year or so, we had several convenings, including the private sector, civil society, and US government officials. And what emerged from that set of um, roundtables and discussions, as well as follow-on follow interviews, were a set of recommendations which are embedded in this report. We are extraordinarily um, lucky to have with us today four individuals who represent each of those sectors and can really speak to how um, these issues play out on the ground and really speak to how we can strengthen the partnerships between the private sector, the US government, particularly those parts of the government that deliver security sector assistance and civil society. So I would like to introduce them now. Um, first, we have Leanna Bresnahan, who is the Chief of the Human Rights Office at the U.S. Southern Command, Southcom. She's been at Southcom since 1996, where she built the human rights program up from scratch. Um, and the human rights program at Southcom, as many of you know, is really the first and only of its kind in the Defense Department. You can find out more about Leanna um, on the bios that we've handed out. We have Jeff Krilla right here, um, who's the Vice President for Global Public Policy and Government Affairs at Cosmos Energy. He joined the company in May of 2015, following an illustrious career in and out of government. Jeff has extensive experience on the issue of corporate social responsibility and the voluntary principles on security and human rights, especially in Africa. We have JJ Messner who is the executive director of the Fund for Peace, a nonprofit organization that focuses on state fragility, conflict early warning, and the intersection of business, security, and human rights. The Fund for Peace was one of the first NGOs involved in the voluntary principles and has helped implement them in over 20 countries. And last but not least, we have Albert Yell Yang, who's joined us from Ghana. 
He is a trainer and expert in peace building, conflict transformation, human security, early warning and response. And he conducts studies on conflict, security and peace. He is also the national network coordinator of West Africa Network for Peace Building Ghana, WANEP, which has been involved in implementing voluntary principles in Ghana. I can think of no better people to discuss how we can strengthen these partnerships and enhance security forces' respect for human rights than these four individuals. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Anywhere in the I'll stay in the middle. Great. Well, Jeff, um, I thought that we could start with you, given that you have experience with the voluntary principles and more generally the issue of security forces and human rights, both in and out of government. Um, I was hoping, given your current perch in the private sector, that you could talk about how the private sector approaches and thinks about human rights and security, and why, why from your perspective, the voluntary principles are so important. Great, great. Well, thanks, Shannon. And first, just a real quick thanks to CSIS, to you and to Julie, for all the hard work you put into this report. I think a lot of what we're going to talk about today is about transparency, is about getting the word out about initiatives like the Voluntary Principles. And I think this report not only is well written, but it's helpful for folks that are not familiar with the VPs to get a good grounding in, in what is an important initiative. Despite the fact that they're 17 years old, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a little bit of a shame and a challenge. But, uh, but we can also talk, I'm sure we'll talk about a lot of what's been done, because there has been a lot of progress. And uh, I'm proud to be up here representing the private sector, because uh, both our company, a number of you know, very active uh, extractive co companies have been very engaged for many years. Many thanks to Chevron also for supporting this effort. They've been certainly a key player in all this as well. So to get to your, your question, sort of the private sector, you know, how are the voluntary principles viewed? Uh, when it comes to Cosmos or it comes to the private sector writ large, we're always looking for ways to minimize risk uh, in our engagement globally, especially in some of the more challenging environments in which we operate. Cosmos is an uh, oil and gas exploration company, works mainly in West Africa. And we work in some challenging environments. And to be honest, you know, the oil and gas sector doesn't always have the best of reputations. And we work in some challenging environments that historically uh, oil and gas companies have had not only challenges in operating there, but they've in some, some cases been part of the problem in, in environments in which they operate. Part of it is the, the business model, but part of it is a lack of understanding of the environments in which they operate. And that, and that brings us to the voluntary principles. When you talk about managing risk, one of our biggest areas of risk is, is often around security. And uh, for us to be able to have a framework, such as the voluntary principles, a framework that allows us to understand how we train our contractors, how we engage with local security forces, how we can uh, engage with local communities, I think it's very important to have a framework that is recognized globally and that is, is one that has been created by a coalition of businesses, governments, and very important civil society players that understand the regions in which we operate, the communities in which we operate, and have helped put together a structure in which we can engage on some very important issues. And I, I would say, uh, you know, for us, the, the voluntary, voluntary principles allow us to, to look at at a community, look at a country in, in areas that we could look to sort of minimize conflict and in some cases if we're not working uh, appropriately to exacerbate in, uh, conflicts that already exist or could exist by the operation, by our operations in, in that region. And Jeff, some of this is covered in the report, um, being that this is one of the major topics, but in your estimation, how can the voluntary be voluntary principles be sort of strengthened in this day and age, or how can awareness be raised about the kind of platform that they offer? Sure. Well, part of it is education. As I said earlier, the report is helpful, but it's only one step. You know, the, the initiative's been around for 17 years now. How do we improve its track record? How do we get the word out, but also work on its implementation? And I would say for that, uh, it's critical for all players involved to work uh, to expand those engaged with the voluntary principles. As a former diplomat who led a mission to Nigeria with civil society leaders, with uh, uh, several governments, and with the companies, I was amazed how much a number of the companies, now this is 10 years ago, 
but but it's still something that I that I'm concerned about on a daily basis, which is the companies are working with civil society to implement the voluntary principles. You've got a lot of governments, mostly Western governments, who have been very involved for many years, but you've got some host governments that don't in some cases don't fully understand the voluntary principles, in some cases are not really aware of the voluntary principles. And I think that that's a critical role for all of us that are involved uh, in implementation of the voluntary principles to rectify. I think um, there's a key role for host governments to play, absolutely. We saw last year with Colombia hosting the voluntary principles, how much progress has been made in a country that initially had not really been a part of the plenary, but had been implementing voluntary principles in their security uh, operations over the years. And I think that Colombia is in many ways a success story. And hosting the plenary last, uh, last year helped highlight that success story. So more host governments involved, uh, deeper engagement from those governments. And I think that's a role for, for both uh, all the governments that are part of it, the companies like Cosmos, Chevron, others that are engaged, as well as the very helpful civil society partners. Mm -hmm. So, Liana, I'm going to throw the next question to you because a lot of what we talk about in the report <laughs> is the fact that we have security sector assistance and we have security cooperation, which represents a major tool that we have in the toolkit. Mm -hmm. We're talking about $250 billion spent on security cooperation since 9-11. As Connor mentioned, we have these relationships in 137 countries. So it was the sense of the people who participated in the convenings that that tool could be used much more strategically to improve partner security forces relationships with, um, with the civilians that they're interacting with. Mm -hmm. um, Southcom is really a model in this respect, so I was hoping that you could talk to us a little bit about how Southcom has integrated human rights issues into its partner engagements. Sure, sure. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure, my first time at CSIS, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so for those of you who may not know, SOUTHCOM is part of the Department of Defense. It's also known as U.S. Southern Command. And we work with the nations of Central and South America and the Caribbean. So that's our area of responsibility. Um, we do have a human rights program that has existed for over 20 years. Um, and it's kind of important, I think, to know that that is a SOUTHCOM invention. That human rights program that we have is not mandated by the Pentagon, by OSD joint staff even you know, anybody at the DC level. So this is something that our commanders in the past, back in the, 20 years ago decided was important to have, granted with some input from State Department and urging from State Department. So we have both an internal and an external focus. On the internal side, we work to make sure that our pers personnel are educated on human rights. We also include combating trafficking in persons, which is a, is a big emphasis of the US government right now. And we work to integrate human rights into everything that Southcom does, including our component commands and our, our joint task forces. But that means integrating human rights into our plans, our strategies, our policies, requiring annual human rights training and, and combating trafficking in persons training for our own folks, and um, advising our, our leadership so that they are prepared to discuss human rights in their uh, meetings with counterparts when they travel down into the region. Um, so that's kind of on the internal side. We're trying to prepare our people so that they can be messengers, so that they know. We have our card. I don't have my, my little human rights card that we wear, the five R's of human rights and so forth. On the external side, which is where our, my office has spent the bulk of its time, is actually promoting a culture of respect for human rights with our partner nation militaries. Um, and by that, we mean not Southcom going down and doing training. It's more of an institutional reform, an institutional development process. Um, we focus on a, a, a series of agreements that were made um, back, way back in the er, late 1990s, early 2000s. It developed a consensus document, which really says that a military human rights program needs to have universal human rights training that's effective, needs to revise its doctrine to include human rights components, needs to have strong, effective, comprehensive, um, internal control mechanisms, and it needs to cooperate with civilian authorities, which sort of morphed over the years into transparency and cooperation with civil, civil society. So that's what we do out of Southcom. It's, I look at it as a security cooperation tool. We also coincidentally call it the Human Rights Initiative, so yeah. <laughs> we have twin efforts going on. And um, it focuses very heavily on buy-in from the partner nation military. So we're focusing on shared values, 
um, all of us serving democratic governments, and we are supporting their efforts. Another hallmark of the, um, of the, of the initiative has always been the involvement of civil society terms of NGOs, civilian government agencies, academia, and so forth, because we consider it very important that it's not the military just talking to itself, but rather bringing in a broad uh, spectrum of perspectives. And nobody knows the human rights situation better in any given country. Uh, nobody knows it better than the, the non-governmental organizations in the country. We have not worked extensively with private industry, so this is like a new a new frontier for, for our program. And I'm, I'm very glad to be learning about the voluntary principles. You say it's 17 years old, and I've always heard the term voluntary principles, and we had some folks at, at our um, seminar last summer, which was great. So I think it's, that's an area for growth mm. in the future. So, well, so Leanna, you talked about the importance of buy-in, and that's mm -hmm. something that came up a lot in the convenings that we did. What lessons have you learned in Southcom in terms of how to get partner security forces to buy into the idea that their number one priority is really to protect the civilians um, within that area of responsibility? Well, I think you know one of the things we've really done is, again, put emphasis on shared values. So we've always been aware that there's this image out there that the United States might come in and hammer you over the head um, with, you know, with preaching to you on human rights. And so we preach our values, but in a way that says, but you share those values too. So we use the international agreements and treaties that that country has as a sovereign decision signed up to. We may educate about, um, about international accountability, the International Criminal Court, the Inter-American System of Human Rights. We always include sort of external validators like the International Committee of the Red Cross, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, academics, um, so that it's not just the U.S. military or the U.S. government sort of preaching, but more external validation from other sources. Mm -hmm. And we also take advantage of the fact that, in general, the U.S. military is really highly respected, at least in this region, I think all, all over the world, as a very professional force and so we take advantage of that. That is, it's a very powerful thing to have a four-star admiral or a four-star general, like General Kelly was our last uh, commander. He became known throughout the region for saying, everything we do at Southcom begins and ends with human rights. And that gained a lot of resonance, not only within Southcom itself, but also in, in the nations where he traveled. It became something that they were repeating back to us when we, when we actually went down to talk to them. So. Interesting. So JJ, your organization has really been in the thick of it when it comes to helping implement the voluntary principles. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how those partnerships come together between governments, the private sector, and civil society, and talk to the audience a little bit about some of the really innovative approaches that the Fund for Peace has used in order to help cultivate a greater respect for human rights amongst security forces. Sure. Well, and first of all, thank you, uh, Shannon and, and Julie and CSIS for putting this together. I think it's a, a very valuable discussion, and, and I think that it is true, uh, as, as Jeffrey was saying before, that it is quite remarkable that Voluntary Principles is 17 years old, and there are many people in this sphere who, who aren't familiar with it, and it really is doing some incredible things, so hopefully this report will uh, help to shine a light on a lot of that. Now, <clears throat> to your question about how we make this, this happen, it really follows the same sort of approach that, that Fund for Peace takes in the way that we uh, deal with the voluntary principles. And that is really in two streams. Uh, one is from a policy perspective. Uh, so the voluntary principles, though it, uh, uh, it is a, a document, uh, it also has an initiative uh, that uh, coalesces around it. And we, uh, uh, we, we play a very strong role in that to uh, ensure that uh, there is a movement behind the document that really pushes its implementation, allows for the sharing of best practices, uh, and to create that engagement between uh, the different pillars, the government, corporate, and uh, civil society pillars. But the other, uh, the other leg to this is implementation. And we do this on a number of levels. Um, first of all, uh, at a national level. Uh, so uh, we use the voluntary principles as a tool for engagement. Uh, and specific through, uh, specifically through activities, but also engaging with stakeholders on the ground. Now, at Fund for Peace, uh, we've done this in Indonesia in the past. We're currently doing this uh, in Ghana with our friends at OneUp Ghana. 
Uh, and there are other organizations who are leading similar efforts in, com in uh, countries like Colombia and Peru uh, and Nigeria, among others. Uh, we also uh, will partner with companies directly. Uh, now, not every NGO will do this, but uh, there are NGOs within the voluntary principles, including the Fund for Peace, uh, that really do view this as the, the, uh, a, an incredibly impactful way of ensuring that human rights are respected by companies. What better way of trying to help ensure that than actually putting some skin in the game and helping companies who do want to, to uh, have positive change within their operations really get from A to B. And finally is engaging directly with the security forces themselves. Again, not something that every NGO will do. Um, but pr through providing assistance on training programs uh, for security forces that focus on responsible security and professionalism and better engagement with communities. Uh, you know, we often say that when it comes to security forces, uh, the importance of training and the importance of professionalization is key because you know, when human rights abuses occur uh, uh, through uh, the deployment of security forces, it's very rare that you get security forces waking up in the morning and deciding, I'm going to go out and commit some human rights abuses today. Now, sometimes, <laughs> sure, sometimes sure it happens, but many times it comes down to poor training, poor communication, poor leadership, poor protocols. And so if we are able to address some of those issues, through this sort of uh, engagement and this level of implementation, then hopefully we can, uh, we can ameliorate some of those. But you know, when we talk about implementation, you know, I think it's important that we actually you know, say what we mean by implementation. And first of all, what we do is we work with all actors. Uh, and the fact that we work with companies, the fact that we work with governments and civil society is really the only way of making sure that every view is addressed and everyone has, uh, has a seat at the table and can really make it work. The term buy-in has been used a number of times today already, and that's key because everyone has to have some sort of stake in the process for it to work. And so we do this in a few different ways. Uh, the example with Ghana that I'm sure Albert will go into a little bit more depth uh, on soon, you know, what we try and do is really multifaceted. One is to look at the regional level. You know, we find communities that are affected by extractive industry operations. So the program that we have in Ghana focuses on six regions around Ghana, four that are affected by uh, mining and two that are affected by oil. And what we do is, first of all, program of education of the stakeholders within the community. What does uh, the nexus of security and human rights mean for them? What do the voluntary principles mean for them? What can they do as a community uh, based uh, on that platform? And more importantly, how can they actually positively engage with companies? Because many of the conflicts that occur between communities and companies uh, often originate from a breakdown of communication whether it be a uh, 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 misunderstanding of expectations or perhaps an inability to air grievances. Uh, this is often a source of conflict and we try and create a platform that really allows for that. And then we take it to a national level where we allow the communities a platform to not only engage directly with the companies but with their own government as well. Uh, and when we talk about a national action plan for countries when it comes to the voluntary principles like for Ghana, it's imperative the local communities actually have a direct line to their own government on this, and it's a two-way street. Because what good is a national action plan if a, if a, a government, and I don't want to single out Ghana, but just as an example, if the government in Accra doesn't understand directly what the interests of communities in the various regions are. And this is the way of basically ground-truthing policy. Um, and another example of the kind of work that we do when it comes to implementation uh, is uh, a, a project that we had in Cameroon uh, some years ago, actually with, with Cosmos Energy, where um, there was a concern over the uh, potential effects of uh, military forces uh, in and around communities as part of those operations. Uh, and so we identified the, the training, the professionalism aspects as being, uh, as being something that we needed to address. And so we set about helping the Cameroonian military on building a training curriculum that actually addressed human rights and was fully integrated into their own training. And 
this was really only possible because the voluntary principles gave us that platform to be able to say, this is part of an overarching international initiative, it's very well respected, it's great for Cameroon, it's great for communities, and it's ultimately going to be good for security forces. So being able to use the voluntary principles as that vehicle uh, was really, uh, was really I I incredibly important in that example. So that hopefully gives you a bit of a taste of, mm -hmm. of what implementation really looks like. Well, let's talk about that example of Captain Cameroon because one of the things that we highlight in the report is that training is not the end-all be-all, but it is a por an important part of the picture. And there are ways that we can improve training, including by really grounding it and the struggles that security forces are having and that communities are having and making sure that it's not just sort of information that's being imparted to them in a very legalistic way, but they have an opportunity to do scenarios and play with it and exercise it. So talk about that a little bit. Like, How did you apply those principles to training in Cameroon to make sure that it wasn't just a check the box exercise? Absolutely. And I think that you know, whenever, you, um, whenever you're engaged with a security force or, or even a, a, a private security company, they may say that we have human rights training. And if they say that we have human rights training, your very first question after that needs to be, what's in your human rights training? Because this particular security force um, were proud of the fact that they had human rights training. But let me tell you what that human rights training was. It was a little book that was a reprint of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Geneva Conventions, and in the back half was a first aid manual. So basically, you're expecting soldiers sitting on post to read through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to read through the Geneva Conventions and decide for themselves, given a conflict situation or a situation where they are engaged uh, with the, the community in perhaps a, a tense situation, that they have to figure out for themselves how to contextualise it. And so what we did was we focused less on the human rights aspect and much more on respect for the community, how to de-escalate conflict because ultimately those practical tools are going to be far more critical mm -hmm. at the end of the day for these soldiers because in the heat of a conflict situation, uh, everyone uh, falls back on muscle memory and it's not the time to be making policy mm -hmm. in, a, in a heated situation. So you, you provide the training, you provide the context and you get the uh, security personnel thinking in that practical way of what is going to de-escalate conflict and what is going to, uh, to protect the safety of the community and the safety of the security forces themselves. Because something that is lost in this, uh, in this situation frequently is that uh, you know, for security forces, safety for them is just as important. And if they recognise that escalating the conflict situation only makes life more unsafe for them, that's a very important message that does tend to resonate. Yeah. Great. So Albert, over to you. You're from Ghana. You've participated in the multifaceted partnership that JJ talked about. I was hoping that you could tell us about the impact of these kinds of partnerships on the ground and how you think that this you know, marriage between the private sector and civil society and governments um, could be strengthened. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much and, uh, for putting the report together for me. You're reading it the first time. Uh, I think I shared a lot of the findings and the various strategies that you seem to explore in the report. And uh, it's a well-written report, and it's worth reading. Everyone can look at it into details. I think that, like uh, JJ indicated, um, you know about OneF Ghana, West African Network for Peace Building, which is operating in 15 West African countries. Um, <coughs> We have been partnering with the Fund for Peace in the implementation of this, uh, the voluntary principles in Ghana. Um, just for you to know that the Ghana government joined the VPs in March 2014. And uh, this is further <coughs> consolidating Ghana's commitment to uh, respect for human rights. And then you know again that Ghana has it's, it's basically agriculture, mining, and services based. And the mining sector is an area, and uh, oil and energy, uh, gas, where many of these multilateral institutions are operating. 
And so you, you see that there is a kind of a competition in there. And much as these contribute to economic growth and development of Ghana, there are also instances where we have abuses, incidences of abuses uh, reported about the operations of these corporations. Um, <clears throat> again, it is important to know that in many of these communities, there is what we call illegal mining, which involves uh, so many of the youth, uh, male and female, and basically driven by the fact that there is poverty in these areas. And so it pushes these youth, male and female, into the, uh, the operations of, uh, I mean, the mines. mines. <clears throat> and they are involved and further poses security risks for these businesses, governments, the US government, and then the communities as well. Um, but it's always difficult to you know, ignore them because you have to look at this nexus, and especially where the issue degenerates into an issue of, uh, into a, a kind of a relationship rather than content. And so the mines, for instance, the Anglo Ashanti has operated in Ghana, you know, Boise, for over 100 years, and it seemed to be part of the community. So decoupling it anyhow can further degenerate the situation. So it is important to look at it in a relationship perspective rather than content, where you just say, okay, ignore it. And so in some of those instances, you realize that um, operations are stopped, then there is huge loss, loss to the investments of these operations. It affects the government of Ghana because royalties are diminished. And then sometimes you see that even employment that youth in particular would be agitating for uh, is lost. So there are <clears throat> this is the context we can look at. Now you talk about the impact. Um, since our operations with the Fund for Peace uh, in Ghana, we've realized that there has been so much dialogue, trainings and dialogue from the community levels. These have fed into national level dialogues, which involves a multi-sectorial participation from various um, departments and ministries, which mines, uh, Chamber of Mines and Minerals Commission, Attorney General, uh, Human Rights Commissions, and all of those institutions. And <clears throat> these, there are also, again, um, support. Um, the US government supported the uh, Fund for Peace and uh, AFRICOM to facilitate a dialogue for the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources in Ghana. And this further increased the understanding of the VPs amongst the various departments that are related to VPs. And it has increased further collaboration and partnership among these uh, groups. Now, you would also talk about the respect for human rights um, that has increased among these discussions. And the creation of peace and stability within these areas, uh, within the operations of the mines, definitely has a kind of impact for the operations businesses of the US government. You know that if these communities are not stable, then obviously there is high risk for these businesses. And an enabled environment will sustain their operations and increase impact. Um, we also have been working with the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, uh, which the US government is supporting strongly in partnership with the government of Ghana and AFRICOM to develop standardized trainings, training models that they will implement or run at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center for the rest of West Africa. And indeed, I know that once it started, everybody globally can participate in those trainings. So basically, these are some of the impacts that we can uh, observe based on our engagement with Ghana. That's great. So I wanted to ask the first question to both of you, Albert and JJ, because both of you have talked about the importance of dialogue and the fact that through these dialogues, communities' grievances, the problems that they're having, the tensions are actually rising up to the surface and are becoming um, more obvious to the government. So I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about that process, because it seems to me to be really important, both as our early warning kind of you know, mechanism to make sure 
that if there are problems that they're addressed before they, you know, explode into some form of violence. But it's also just helpful more broadly in terms of connecting the national local government with communities. So if either of you could talk about that dialogue process and how you've seen it um, materialize. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that the, um, uh, if you look at the context, very often there has been lack of communication amongst the three stakeholders of the VPs, the government, civil society, uh, communities, and the private sector. Now, when that happens, there is lack of understanding amongst these stakeholders. And then also you would realize that the, 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 the expectations from all levels, you know, are misunderstood, there is misconception. And so when there is dialogue, the understanding is increased from all angles, that I understand you from your perspective, you understand me from my perspective, and therefore I can relate to you well through my understanding of your perspective. And at that level, we involve the communities, traditional leaders, the media, we involve the security operatives, private and public, we involve the district assemblies, which is the very local level of the government, uh, we involve the corporations and other uh, commissions and agencies that are related to the VPs. Now, all these stakeholders discuss the concerns that, uh, that emerge based on their operations, and then they design strategies to mitigate those risks. Now, that is very important because what that, it, it reduces the level of vulnerabilities of all these stakeholders, and therefore they are able to chart a common path towards ensuring the respect for human rights and security in those communities that sustain business operations. Um, and I, I think a couple things I would add to that is, first of all, I think it's important to understand, especially in the context of this report, you know, what the role of external intervention is into these sorts of processes. Because the, the project that, uh, that, that uh, we're very fortunate to be partnering with, with OneF on in Ghana uh, is funded by the US State Department. And I think that it really takes sometimes that external intervention to catalyze these sorts of dialogues because having an external actor come in and provide this platform where it may not have existed before because you know, for a community to be able to engage with uh, one company operating in, in the area, it might be possible to engage with a whole group of companies operating in an area, that's a really heavy lift for a local community. And so to be able to provide that platform, sometimes it does take an external actor. And that is, I think, why it's so important that governments like the US really do put resources into, into those sorts of programs. But there are, I think, a couple of uh, really good examples about the, the sort of dialogue that we're talking about. You know, one, is, as Albert talks about, the um, uh, clarity and, and, and getting past misunderstandings. You know, there's uh, one issue that has come up in our regional dialogues about the, um, the, the uh, conflicts between uh, uh, offshore oil drilling and uh, fisher folk. And so you have fishermen who are uh, you know, fishing in waters where they've, they've fished for their entire lives, their fathers fished there, their grandfathers fished there, and now there's uh, oil exploration right in the middle of that area. Now, uh, I don't know if many of you are aware of this, but um, uh, when you put an oil rig uh, into, uh, into the water, uh, some of you might think that, well, that means that the fish all disappear, but it actually is the reverse because the rigs tend to create artificial reefs whereby the fish are often attracted to the reefs and uh, to the rigs, and also the lights around the rigs even attract more of them. And so there's an incentive for the fishermen to, uh, to, to go into what are restricted areas because that's where all the rich fishing is. And, and sometimes when you have the Navy or the, the Marine Police going out and shooing away the fishermen, it's not always apparent to the fishermen why they're being shooed away. This can create conflict. And so to be able to have a, uh, a, a platform for dialogue where you have the company, you have the, I actually met the chief fishmonger, which is a position, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and have the fishermen, have, have the, uh, the navy, the marine police, sitting in the same room, around the same table, actually discussing, this is why we're shooing you away. And the fact that you're using explosives to, to fish, 
Uh, that's a really bad idea around an oil rig. <laughs> Those sorts of things are really important to impart. And, and without that platform for dialogue, it can be really uh, missed. The other thing too that I would point out is these kinds of dialogues are really useful for bringing in, uh, say, non-traditional actors. Because in, uh, in, in, in much of the discussion of business and human rights, we focus very much on Western companies. So American companies, European companies. And one of the really remarkable things about our program in Ghana that I certainly wouldn't have expected uh, at the beginning is within our dialogue, we have a Chinese mining company. We will soon have uh, an Indian mining company. And yeah, there is some, uh, there is some uh, discussion on business and human rights with, uh, with, country, uh, with companies from these countries, but uh, I, it's, it's rare. And so being able to have a platform that draws in from a business and human rights community perspective what are a little more non-traditional actors uh, has been, I think, a real milestone as well. Great, and then I'm gonna, oh, you wanna okay. say something else? Uh, yes, well, not something else. <laughs> <laughs> but just to add that, what the, the support of the international community in these dialogues is really very important because it brings together all the other governments that are operating in country, mm. you know, and creates that platform for partnership. Um, and again, like JJ indicated, if at the, the oil and gas uh, industry, um, and even with the mines, a security force will tell you what it means to use minimum force, which is misunderstood by the communities. Now, during such dialogues, they explain what minimum force means and explaining the individual security operations. For instance, the police has a different, different modus operandi. The military has a different modus operandi. So if they understand the operations of these security forces, then they are able to better cooperate with them in implementing uh, 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 regulations. Mm. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about Ghana, which in many cases is held up as a model. But as both Liana and Jeff have mentioned, these kinds of partnerships don't always come together very easily. Um, so I wanted both of you to talk about what are the barriers to collaboration between the private sector and the US government, and how have you seen those barriers um, be overcome? Well, if I could maybe just start, because uh, I wanted yeah. to add a little bit about dialogue. Yeah. Uh, what we've seen in, in our region um, is what a role dialogue can play in terms of healing wounds that are left over. You know, in Central America, for instance, we have a, a region that had many internal conflicts, a lot of brutality, a lot of civilian deaths. And so there are a lot of psychic wounds, emotional wounds that are left over, even though these conflicts ended 20 years ago. Um, and so what we've been able to do through the Human Rights Initiative is, is sponsor what we call civil military dialogues and actually bring in sort of a, an equal number of human rights uh, groups um, and with military leaders and have them just sit and talk to each other about issues related to their distrust of each other, their need for, for healing. Um, and we've actually kind of worked on in, into a model or developed a model where we, we make working groups and we have mixed working groups. So we actually put military and NGOs or military and civil society representatives together and ask them to come up with products, whether it just be what are the obstacles to us getting along or what are the things that still need to be worked out or what, how can we work together in the future. And we do that on a repeated basis, like maybe once a year or twice a year. And we've seen remarkable breakthroughs. And it's just a very human thing. When you just actually get to know each other, and then more than that, you're actually working together to develop something new. Um, it, it's just been really uh, very, very rewarding. And again, one would ask, why do they need Southcom or, or the US Embassy? They're all in the same country. Why doesn't this happen on its own? But the fact is, it just sometimes doesn't. And so we've been able to see, too, over time, maybe it takes two or three years of these type of things before you just get this sense, OK, they've got the relationships now. Now they can take this and move forward. And it's not going to die if we don't come back you know, every year. So I've, I've actually seen NGOs stand up who were very anti-military and give heartfelt 
sort of proclamations about these are the military they've always dreamed of having in their country. Um, I've seen colonels cry in public, not saying I never understood before how my force that I'm so proud of is seen by, the, by civil society. So I just wanted to say it's, it's been a very powerful tool for us and might be able to be replicated in other areas. And on the issue of the private sector, you mentioned that there was this conversation around the VPs last year. Right. Clearly, there's a lot of engagement with civil society. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that the engagement with the private sector has lagged behind? In, in our AOR? Yeah. Um, I think it's just been a lack of awareness. Mm. And because our model has been more to work with, um, with the local governments, both government and military. Um, and our natural outreach was to human rights groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, more to follow. Yeah. <laughs> and Jeff, what have you seen both inside of government and on the outside? Well, I'll start off with my first experience in government uh, at the State Department, which is, was working in the Democracy and Human Rights and Labor Bureau. And I think it goes to the heart of our sort of challenges here in that when you have an, uh, a framework like the voluntary principles, you hear security and human rights, and people say, okay, let's talk to the Human Rights Bureau. Well, that's great. That's fantastic. It's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. But if your, all your knowledge in the State Department is in the Democracy and Human Rights Bureau on this important initiative, you've, you've lost, yeah. or at least you've got a bigger challenge ahead of you. You need to incorporate all aspects. Now, the U.S. government is massive. Even the State Department is quite large and trying to get regional bureaus, trying to get those that also have that r relationship with security engaged at the State Department was a challenge, continues to be a challenge, and then you, you take that to the embassy and it's the same thing. If the ambassador says, ooh, voluntary principles and security and right, human rights, I got a human rights guy. Okay, great, but you also have to get the, get the security folks in. I'm really encouraged by, by having a DOD representative here and hearing about General Kelly talking about human rights being not just American values, but, but global values. And I think when we talk about a number of these frameworks, when we talk about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we talk about relevant aspects of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. These are things that are universal values. They're not American values. So it's important for us to make sure that across the US government there's engagement not just the most likely players. Uh, you've got to push on doors that aren't always open. And, and I think it's good to hear DOD engaged. From a private sector perspective, we also don't always speak military. So we don't always think when we go into a country, or even in DC, you know, let's talk to the State Department, let's talk to Commerce. Uh, I don't think there's always that, that understanding that DOD plays a critical role, especially, I mean, the word security is in the, uh, the initiative. So I think it's important for DOD to reach out, but for the private sector to understand that that com communication is very helpful. And then, of course, you, you project it into the host government as well. It's always easy to go to government X and then meet with the human rights lead. <laughs> but, um, you know, I would challenge that there's a lot of heads of state that may not know who their human rights lead is in the government. And I think that's a, that's a challenge, and they probably know who the head of the military is. But I think um, you need to work with the players that are engaged across mm -hmm. the government. The Human Rights Office or Bureau or Department, whatever, may be that first stop, but you can't stop there. And, uh, and the U.S. government is a good example, but the host government is equally good example. Yeah. Adding to that complexity, in the report we reference um, a study done by Rose Jackson at OSF where she mapped the 46 different bureaus within the U.S. government that have some responsibility for security sector assistance. So one of the things that we're calling for in terms of helping these partnerships come together is really having streamlined processes at the National Security Council level, at headquarters level, and in the field to rationalize some of the decision making around security sector assistance and make sure that we're able to measure it, not just from a tactical standpoint, but also measure the impact of that assistance on security forces' behavior, um, including the way they interact with civilians um, and the degree to which they respect human rights. So I think that's an important point. Did you want to add something? Uh, yes. I wanted to say that one of the reasons for the private sector lacking behind um, is it comes from this. But, um, many of the private sector uh, cooperatives um, stop at safety and health. Mm 
in terms of the understanding of the VPs. They do not go much further, especially the very small ones. You know, the other thing is that I think the communities do not demand that much because they do not have much awareness. And so the private sector is only, so there's no demand. It's only when the private sector it feels that the communities should be aware of the VPs and demand their rights and ensure that there is respect for rights at the, you know, that we now see it happening and beginning to draw them in and become more and more active. Otherwise, very often, uh, and uh, there are small companies that do not have the eye of the international communities usually think that they can get away, you know, and they try to maximize profits before, uh, until they become big, then they, now, they can now ensure that they go by all the values of the VPs. And I think these are some of the reasons why the private sector is lacking behind. And of course, there is no uh, kind of standardized and oversight responsibility from some of the governments. And so uh, when that happens, then um, of course, some of the governments also, you see that there are elements within that mediate benefits. And so the private sector can get away. You know? And these are some of the, uh, the challenges or the reasons for which the private sector might still be lacking behind. Great. Well, we have some time for audience members to ask questions. My colleague Julie will be passing around the mic. Um, please ra raise your hand. We'll take about three questions at a time. Um, introduce who you are and what your affiliation is if you have one. And please make sure you keep your question to a question. So right up here. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Michael. I'm an advisor here at CSIS and uh, <laughs> consultant. Uh, I had a, a definitional question. Uh, you have these voluntary principles. Over here somewhere you have the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, and I wonder if there's any linkage or connection between these that perhaps can give credibility to the private sector that is engaged in dialogue under the voluntary principles. I just wonder how these interact. Great question. Yeah. Um, so the, the voluntary principles are relatively narrow in focus in the sense that they, they deal really only with security issues uh, as they pertain to, uh, to human rights. Now, that's not to say that there's no linkage whatsoever because um, uh, even within our uh, project in Ghana, even though it's very much a, a project driven by the voluntary principles, we do have a component of it that focuses on revenue transparency uh, because uh, you know, when, you, when you look at uh, security issues that manifest themselves in the extractive sector, 90% um, you know, of security issues were at one stage a social issue or an economic issue and, or a governance issue. And so from that standpoint, there is the natural linkage between uh, an initiative like the Voluntary Principles and EITI. They're just at different stages of the process because if you can address issues like revenue transparency, then that is in itself going to de-escalate conflict for communities that are concerned about that. Yeah. Um, so that's where the linkage is. They are related, but are different links in the chain. I think that gets back to the point that Albert was making in terms of a mismatch between expectations. So if communities think they're going to be getting one thing and in reality they're getting something else, that can be you know, a flashpoint for conflict. <laughs> Well, and also to add to a point she raised earlier, um, if you look at it, um, the, the, the involvement of governments, the US government, and then the in-country governments, um, will lead to policy reviews that will address some of the structural issues at that level, at the lower mm -hmm. levels. And then, as JJ indicated, these will minimize the risk uh, that operations will, fa will face, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jim, you mind? Yep. I, I think that was, I'm glad you raised that point, Jim, about EITI, because I think all of these mechanisms can be used uh, not only to practice for, for companies that are already part of the initiatives, but I love the idea of a future where the host governments are using these standards to, to uh, interview companies coming in to work in their countries. Mm, I, recent, I was in Liberia last year, and I went to meet with President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who I've known for many years, but uh, only recently did I connect with her in my new capacity now with Cosmos Energy. 
And she said, we're very interested in engaging with companies like Cosmos because we know you're committed to EITI, mm -hmm. to transparency. She had like basically chatted with other heads of state and knew about our <laughs> operations in West Africa and our commitment to EITI. And I was inspired on so many levels to think <laughs> this is a head of state who's doing their homework mm -hmm. and is committed to initiatives. Now what happens if a Chinese company or another company or another American company that's not part of EITI comes in I hope they get the same question, and I hope that that company then looks into these initiatives and joining these initiatives. So I'd like to think that years down the road, maybe not that many years down the road, we can see this as a, a, a metric that, uh, that host governments could say, are you part of these initiatives? Because we're committed to them. Are you? There was, yep, I had in the back. Uh, hello, Johnson Yuan, uh, you fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, so the voluntary principles is, um, as uh, JJ said, is an uh, engagement tool to different stakeholders. And um, so like six, year, six years ago, the business and human rights working groups in the United Nations, they identified three pillars to achieve business and human rights, which is to protect, to respect, and for remedy. And for protections and remedy, it's more a pointage to a regulatory trait framework that victims of uh, human rights violations can hold the uh, actor accountable. And like in France and Switzerland, they are starting to have debates and discussions on whether um, the government, the whole country government of multinational company should hold those company accountable if those company didn't do enough due diligence work. So I would like to ask that, what, when do you think is the right timing for private sector to take a step uh, further and forward to combine with a more regulatory mechanism rather than just staying in voluntary principles? Thank you. There was another hand in the middle. Yep, right there. Steve Mosley with the United Nations Association, the Alliance for Peace. This has been a very valuable and um, a happy discussion. I'm particularly interested in the, the, the relationships that you, you've described very much. It also comes on a sort of a fateful day because tomorrow um, the new budget for FY17 will be, at least begin to be presented and it's, it's said to have a $54 billion increase in mainly hardware orientation for the, state, for the Defense Department. And yet we've been very pleased to see, on the very subject you've been talking about, a modest but continuing growth curve up on peace building and the relationship building between the Defense Department, State Department, private sectors, and NGOs. And I, just as you described, it, very, very positive. Um, is, is CIS's report that we, on which this is based uh, has some very practical, um, down-to-earth recommendations on, uh, on resource development, on collaboration, on building budgets in the peace building area. Um, could you talk a little bit in the, in the new era, and the new uh, administration, where CIS, CSIS uh, and you and your advocacy, you think you could uh, support these principles going forward and help build the, the kind of models that you talked about in Southcom to other areas? Thank you. Um, does anybody want to start with a question about whether there is a need and when is the right time for more of a regulatory approach? Yeah, I can take that. Um, I think perhaps one of the biggest mistakes that the voluntary principles made at the outset was calling itself the voluntary principles, uh, because uh, you know, no one is no company is necessarily compelled to implement the voluntary principles, but once you've committed yourself to implement the voluntary principles. You have publicly declared that you are going to implement it and you are going to be held uh, to account for your, for your uh, uh, implementation. Now, I think what has really signified the success of the voluntary principles is, sure, it's a voluntary initiative. It was created for the oil, gas and mining sectors, uh, but now it is implemented by companies in construction, in agriculture, transportation, renewable energy. Uh, all these other sectors for whom it was not designed for are implementing it. And I mean, that is the extreme end of voluntary where you're uh, implementing someone else's standard that, that they're not even uh, expected to implement uh, from a mandatory perspective. And so I think from that perspective, 
if an initiative is practical enough and it really not only at the same time um, safeguards communities but also manages to uh, increase the effectiveness of business operations, then that's a good initiative in my view. And when we talk about mandatory regulation versus voluntary uh, initiatives, in my experience, Mandatory regulation is boiled down to the lowest common denominator. It is the basic level. And I think that a lot, of, a lot can be lost in, in mandatory regulation, whereas something like the voluntary principles that is, by its nature, voluntary, is really a much higher tide. Uh, and so I think that that is, uh, that is definitely to, to the advantage of, uh, of an initiative like that. Um, do you mind if I address the, the budget sure. question? Um, and, and to the second question on the budgetary priorities of, of the new administration, one thing I would say about that is when you look at, you know, again, repeating the fact that the voluntary principles implementation at the national level in Ghana, for example, is funded by State Department. In that sense, it would be argued that it's foreign aid. But I think that we need to differentiate in these discussions between foreign aid and charity because this is, these sorts of programs are making a fundamental difference, not only to Ghana, but if we're gonna be transactional about it, it's making a fundamental difference for America as well. Because when it comes to creating, uh, when it comes to US investment, US operations in foreign countries, uh, there is a higher cost associated with conflict. There is a higher cost associated with instability that comes from that conflict. And so if you are able to invest in programs that develop a more stable operating environment in foreign countries, from a purely transactional point of view, it's cheaper and more effective for American companies operating in those environments. So you can approach foreign aid from the perspective of what's good for all mankind, or you can approach it from the perspective of what's good for America. Mm -hmm. And on both levels, this succeeds. Yep. I agree, and I wanted to add to JJ's um, position on the budget, which is to say that a lot of the concrete recommendations in this report aren't very costly from a financial perspective. They require <laughs> political will, and they require a great deal of sort of organizational reform. And what I mean by that, you know, we're calling for streamlining processes um, and collapsing the number of units and actors involved in making decisions around security sector assistance and making sure that our security cooperation is closely tied to our interests and our values, right? We're talking about being able to measure the impact of that security cooperation in terms of the behavior of our partners. A lot of that is already in train because of the 2017 National Defense Authorization Act. So a lot of those reforms are going to be happening. In addition, when we're talking about making sure that we're cultivating those kinds of partnerships at the local level, that's just the embassy using its good offices and its convening power and authority to get the different actors within the country together. So yes, there is some cost, especially, you know, we basically recommended that we have a office similar to Leanna's office in each combatant command, and that would have a price tag attached to it. But since DOD seems to be on the receiving end of additional resources, that shouldn't be too much of a challenge. <laughs> um, there was a hand in the back, a woman, yeah. Hello, my name is Erin Marr. I'm a private industry security intelligence analyst. And my question is a direct follow-up to what you were saying about it being cheaper and more effective to implement these things. Because I'm going to go into uh, chief security officer and bring this up. And they're going to say, that sounds wonderful. And you say it's going to save me money. They need to be able to see when I say, yes, this is going to save you money. So my question is kind of procedural. Do we go back and look at the data over a three-month period after we begin implementing these? two years, five years, in your experience, when do we start to see turnaround? How can I pitch this? Is the proving the negative? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. I think it is definitely proving the negative. Um, but I, I think from, um, uh, from the perspective of how long can we tell that there has been some sort of gain, it's very context specific. Uh, and uh, you know, from a, from a business operations perspective, 
what we're talking about here are a lot of real intangibles because, uh, you know, we, and, and some of it does to a degree, depending on the country, require a certain amount of faith in, in the end result because uh, an initiative like the Voluntary Principles uh, and the, the manner in which it, it encourages companies to engage uh, with the host country on security issues, which are fundamentally a very sensitive issue to, to discuss with the government. Uh, but it also provides a platform for doing so. Now, that engagement, uh, who knows when it will necessarily bear fruit. Uh, but it, it is really the, the dog that didn't bark because yeah, I can think of a particular platinum mine in South Africa that's probably regretting that they didn't have more robust discussions with the South African police force right now. Uh, and so, you know, who knows if, uh, if, if the voluntary principles uh, could have prevented uh, that situation. Uh, but I think that the, uh, the experience uh, throughout, uh, throughout the extractive sector that has implemented the voluntary principles would suggest that implementation, that level of engagement has reduced the propensity of those sorts of incidents to occur. And ultimately, when any of those incidents occur, it's going to be an enormous cost for business. So uh, it's, it's like insurance, right? You don't know when your house is going to burn down, but when your house does burn down, you're going to be pretty thankful that you had insurance. Yeah. I mean, I do think we cited an example of the report of Talisman Energy and their investments in Sudan. Um, where they hadn't done some of that work up front, which is called for in the voluntary principles in terms of doing your risk assessment um, and having those conversations and understanding what the risk profile is. Um, they seem to have not done that sufficiently. And so over the course of their operations in Sudan, there was a lot of um, conflict. There were a lot of criticisms that they were engaged in abetting the government's human rights abuses and gross um, violations of human rights, so much that it escalated again and again and again. They got um, sued and eventually pulled out of the country. Unfortunately, another company came in and took their place, um, so the cycle of abuses didn't end. But that's an example, I think, of a company that got in without sort of a full understanding of what they were getting into and then ended up having to pull out their operations at great expense because the situation was so bad. Robert, you wanted to ask something? Yes, uh, I think that um, very often it is difficult to measure the impact of peace interventions. Uh, mm -hmm. and because people want to see the tangibles. And it is understood that a very stable environment attracts investments and sustains business. And the risk is not to undertake a risk assessment that you will design strategies to mitigate those risks. And so it is, you will not see the tangibles, but then it is important to appreciate that without any of such activities, risk assessments and mitigating strategies, then obviously you will not even have the opportunity to operate. An example are two institutions, two corporations in Ghana. And we think that they, at the beginning, the inception of their operations, probably ignored uh, the dangers in their operations. And later on, for several years, they had to spend so much time and effort engaging public security offices, uh, officers you know, to sustain, curtail violence, for instance, and restore order, order in those areas. And even it was at the expense of government, which was huge, huge cost, it was at the expense of the, those corporations, and we think that no institution, a private sector, should engage in such tendency because the risk of conflicts to those businesses are more uh, 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 disastrous. Yeah. Can I just say something? Yeah. Um, and I'm speaking totally just for Liana Bresnahan, not for Southcom, but um, if I could tell you the amount of money that we have spent over the years in human rights promotion, it's by government standards, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly because we've never had much, you know? Um, but you can do a lot just by being able to sponsor a conference, just being, by being able to travel down to a country and just talk to people. It's really not a high cost item. There's not a lot of equipment, you know? Um, so I think that there's a lot more engagement that could go on on part of DOD and all of the US government.
without investing huge amounts of resources. And when I look at Columbia, for instance, um, I give the vast majority of credit to the improvement that's happened in Colombia, to the Colombians themselves, and the political will that they showed and, and just the comprehension that they, that they had toward the necessity of doing the right thing on human rights. But when you look at Colombia today versus what it was when Plan Colombia first started, for instance, in the early 2000, uh, it's a much more vibrant, prosperous, and peaceful country, you know. And that didn't take a lot of, it took their resources. They have invested a great deal of money in their human rights program for the military, for the police and so forth. But it didn't take a lot of US resources. It took encouragement, engagement, friendship, support. So. I feel like I'm ignoring this side. Were there any questions on this side that I haven't seen? No, OK. And then quiet side there's of the a gentleman over there. Hi, my name is Charlie Gilman. I'm with the U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, scientist turned technocrat. So, <laughs> and from academia, I'm going to ask a terrible question. Um, so, this kind of implies that uh, by improving human rights, we improve security and economics, which I personally believe, and I know there's data to support this. But that implies that by um, addressing the root causes of human rights problems, that either human rights problems are causing problems in security and economics, or they share the same causes. Do you see what I mean? So, well, what would you say about this? What is the cause of human rights problems? Is that, and is that the same causes of security problems for the United States in particular? Or um, can we actually improve security by improving human rights? Or both, of course. <laughs> Um, well, I, I think that you do bring up a good point about root causes, uh, because I think, you know, to, con to contextualise where the voluntary principle sits within the spectrum, uh, it really is the tip of the spear, to borrow an analogy. Um, but uh, in the sense that, you know, as I said before, you know, I reckon probably 90% of, of security issues were at one stage social, environmental, economic governance issues to begin with that created the, the friction that created the, the conflict. Now, you know, when, when we look at an initiative like the Voluntary Principles, or just more broadly speaking, looking at security, we can't solve uh, those, many of those social governance economic issues overnight. The, the issues that can be, in some cases, generational. Uh, but what we can do is by making, uh, in, in many respects, relatively small tweaks to an approach to security, what we're doing is we're recognising that uh, if conflict occurs as a result of these more mm, socially, economically governance-based uh, concerns, that security and the response to that conflict doesn't make things worse. And I think that that's really what this, this piece of the, 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 the puzzle is really trying to do. Because, you know, without major governance reforms, without major reform to the economy, those things aren't going to change particularly quickly, but we can stop it from escalating even further. Yeah. So a good, I think a good uh, uh, example of that would be, uh, you know, take a protest or a demonstration. You know, a, a community demonstrates at the gate of, uh, of a mine. And it doesn't, in that, in that regard, what caused that demonstration in the first place is a whole other issue. The issue at play right that minute is how security, whether it be the private security guards of the mine or the police or the military, deal with that demonstration. And if that demonstration has a peaceful outcome, everybody goes home, their grievances haven't been addressed yet, but you know, we can, we can uh, uh, at least rest assured that their grievances are not the security response. That you know, the, the approach to their social issues or economic issues are in a whole other bucket. Uh, but at least the situation has not been made worse and there's not bloodshed and those sorts of, uh, those sorts of concerns. So that's, that's how I would contextualise the voluntary principles in this. Yep, I agree. Excellent. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs>
If not, um, I'd like you to join me in thanking our excellent guests. We have Rihanna, Albert, JJ, and Jeff.